According to me, this is my last set of, the last slide I showed you guys last class, right? Where we have phase difference embedded here. And this would be a sum, the electric field from all the, generated by all of the electrons in an atom when they get detected by the detector. And this is what the Q is doing. It's basically letting us do this summation and it's in a simple way. And that's your scattering weight vector. So you're able to keep track of the phase differences due to the relative position of the electrons. I think that's where we stop, right? All right. So, Let's continue from there. I'm gonna make sure that if there's somebody waiting in their room, they're good. So I have incoming wave, again, going in this direction. I have incoming wave vector. I have the nuclei right there. And we can assume that this is the electron cloud. Depends on position R, right? And this is where all of the electrons might be the, the electrons in our, in our system. So for instance, if we go from here to here, this is the vector R. And in R, we have a little volume of space right here. So this is where R is, right? So we have this guy, dx, dy, dc, if we're into Cartesian coordinates. And then this incoming wave hits the electrons and it goes in this direction. That would be my scattered direction. And that's the um, direction of our detector too. So before we said there are different positions, we have this wave vector and such. But what happens is that the electrons are distributed and this distribution of the electrons is like this cloud, right? So they're not point particles, they're actual clouds in the system. And you're gonna have that the electronic configuration of the system gives you what shape these clouds are in. They could be S electrons, they could be P electrons, they could be D electrons, right? They're in different positions. And is that when you collect all of those um, waves coming out being scattered by those clouds of electrons, you're gonna see interference. And that interference of the waves is what we're after. So let me go back to this equation over here. This is the one that I told you, right? We actually have to modify it. And the modification that we have, because the electrons are not point charges, but a distribution of charge that when you integrate this NE, you get the number of electrons back. So this distribution of charge has to be included there. And we end up that the previous equation becomes some quantity, quantity then a sum over the atom, the charge of the system, the electronic charge density, and then this negative I Q dotted with R integrated over our volume. So this sounds like it might be something complicated, right? 
I mean, you have to do an integral, so it becomes complicated. But it turns out that people have calculated these things already. And these integrals become things that are just constants for whatever atom. So let's say you had lead, you do these things, and boom, you have a number. Let's say you have iron, and lead is 82, iron is 26. Those two numbers would be different when you do the integrals. There's way more electrons in lead than iron, right? There's the electrons in iron, there's p electrons, there's electrons, but the same thing can be said for lead. So those things are called atomic form factors. So because the cloud of electrons are the same for each atom, The above integral has been calculated. And we have, let me use another color, atomic form factors. We usually use a little uh, lowercase f that is a function of Q. And this is defined as the ratio between this total and this quantity ES and is this integral part. Questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I need to check if anybody's in the waiting room in the other channel. So don't get confused by that part. Just to check if, if you're awake. So, um, for a few atoms, you would be different. And for instance, um, let me make this plot right here. Here, I'm gonna put the atomic form factor. And here, this is a quantity that varies with the scattering weight vector. It's in inverse Armstrongs, and it's basically the scattering weight vector Q. If we look at something like iron, it's gonna be like this. Then chlorine, it looks like this. And then it's decaying towards zero. This is the sodium ion. The oxygen ion. And carbon. So those would be the f of q is as a function of q and this is the value of the wave, uh, wavelength of the light being used usually x-rays 
And you see that this is proportional to how many iron has more electrons. So this is proportional basically to how many electrons you have on the system. So lead would be higher than iron. And it goes to zero for all of them as Q starts increasing. So this is the static atomic form factor. So now we have something else. So now we would have the static the structure factor. This is atomic structure factor. We have an static structure factor. And uh, what we would have here is that now we have something in space. We have incoming radiation. Now we're gonna have some atoms here maybe in a lattice. Let me go back to see if somebody's in the waiting room. Nope. All right. And each of these guys is gonna have that they're scattering radiation, right? In that direction. And basically we would have a vector in this direction QS, KS. So we have that for the atomic version. This is from many electrons in the same atom. Now we have a bunch of atoms. Well, actually it could be a bunch of whatever, right? It could be butterflies. But we're in a solid state class, so we have to assume they're atoms. So each scatter has their atomic form factor right here. And we have a collection of them, I of them. For each of them, this is the eighth one or something. Each of them, you're gonna have this atomic uh, structure factor. And then we have to do the total over all of them. So we look at the total scattered field and we would get some internal atomic structure factor, then a summation. Then we have to do little fi of Q, which is what we calculated. And then how each of those scatterers, individual scatterers differ in phase. Here we have different Qs, right? Before the Q, was located in the atom, in the nuclei, and we were looking at the distance from Q. Q was telling us the direction of, of this vector that was going from the center, the position of the different electrons in the atom. Here we would have different atoms, so therefore there's a summation of our atoms. And we have this I, QI, the Q depends on which atom you're in. Questions? No, yeah. So you have two vectors, K I, this direction, K S in that other direction, and Q is K S minus K I. So it's that direction, right? But you have several atoms, so therefore Q changes a little bit with each of the atoms. So there's a Q for each of the atoms. If you have three atoms, this is three different cues. So uh, when you do experiments, 
you don't measure the electric field, you actually measure the intensity, right? So you don't measure the electric field. I mean, you could measure electric fields, but people that usually measure intensity. So intensity is the square of the modulus of the field. So I take this electric field and square it and I get intensity. So intensity is usually an I. It would be this total electric field squared. And if we do that, we have this term squared, then we would have a summation. This is a summation over I, where we have the structure fact, the atomic structure factors. So this should have a little I right there. So let me just forget about the I's for the Q's because there, there's too many things. And, This term up here, this guy is a complex number, right? So when you take the square of a complex number, it's not just the square by the same number by itself, but it's the complex conjugate of the number. So then we would have to do the square of it. Now my summation is another dummy variable. Instead of I, I'm gonna use J, F of J. We have the Q right here e to the negative i q r j and all of this is done the complex of it when you're doing so i was talking here about electric field when you're doing the measurement with neutrons you um you don't detect the neutron wave function coming out but you, what you detect is the probability of observing a neutron. So it's the same thing, right? You have to square not the wave function. In that case for neutrons, you would be the wave function. So you square it and you get the probability density of the neutrons. So it's the same thing as this for electric fields. It's just easier because they're classical to do the calculations. But if you're doing the neutrons, you're just using quantum mechanics. This would be the equation of the detecting of the, of the wave function. You square it, you get probability. So it's the same math. So because we're squaring it like this, and let me assume that all of these particles are the same, right? So it's a, a sim simple, simplest case, all of the atoms are the same. So I don't have to worry about constants. But if you have an alloy, then you would have terms that differ because of the elements right here. So we're assuming identical atoms in there. And then I can take things out. So I would have the first one squared. This F appears in both, so it's also squared. And then um, I'm gonna do a math trick. I'm gonna multiply by N and then I'm gonna divide by one over N. So that's okay, right? So now I have a summation over I and I have a summation over J. I'm just gonna put them together because what I wanna do I already took this f of q, right? What I wanna do is look at this exponential and because this exponential is multiplying this exponential, I can add the terms above here and have e to the negative i q, then is the i's are i. And then because of the complex conjugate, this is not a plus, but rather a minus r j. Questions?
Clear? Okay. So these are identical particles. Therefore, I got to away with moving this out of the way. So what I'm gonna do is say I have this term, I have this term, then I have n, and then this thing in the brackets is gonna be called s that depends on q. Questions? And this is called the static. Form factor. And what this is, is let me rewrite it again. S of Q is one over N. And then when you're doing this measurement, you're not using just a little unit cell of your system. You have a bunch of them, right? So you can consider that you have an ensemble of unit cells. What you actually measured is not just one instance of a scattering, but rather an ensemble of scattering events. So we're measuring the average over all of them. And the way that this is denoted is with this uh, big bracket, and we have the sum over i, the sum over j, e to the negative i q dotted with r i minus r j, that all of these guys are vector. And then closing the bracket. And this means that you have an average over ensembles. All right, questions? So what is this SQ? Any ideas? Any volunteers to kind of give it a meaning, a physical meaning? Amen? No? Yeah? Uh, yeah, but you have that's that's yeah, your approximation is over, let's say, one unit cell, and you're averaging over a bunch of unit cells. So, this would count how many cells you have now. The other thing, though, is this part. This is the most important part. Yes, so this is momentum, right? Wave, vect wave vector, actually. So it's one over Armstrong, and this is usually in Armstrong's. So when you multiply them together, you get a what? A dimensionless, which can also be an angle, right? Yeah. And in this case, what you have is that you're averaging over the effect of the phase due to the separation between the particles. So you have a bunch of particles and you're looking at how those particles because the light is passing through all of them, each of them throws electromagnetic field. And when you're detecting over there, you have that this particle and this particle, um, what do they do? Cosmo? 
So you have a wave passing through your ensemble. You put your detector at one position. Right, and then give the average. Enable the average deflection uh, for that wave. For that wave at that angle, what is the interference that happens around that ensemble of particles? So remember, you can change the angle of your detector, right? So you will be changing the value of that angle. And you would see that at some directions, some cues, those angles, for the, some cues, the interference is gonna dis be destructive. For others, it's gonna add up. Destructive and, and uh, constructive interference. So it's not dependent, this quantity so far does not depend on the particles, the waves that you're sending in. So at this point, it could be X-rays, or it could be gamma rays, or it could be neutrons. Okay. They depend on this scattering wave vector because of Q, the QS. Right, so it's the measure of the phase differences. That you will get whether at some particular Q value you have destructive or constructive interference for this ensemble that are separated at those positions R1, R2, R3 for each of them. So you're summing over all of the positions and getting a pair up. So, like you were saying, this Q is inverse to length, right? So let's talk about Q now. So you have a relevant um, length scale. And Q is the inverse of that re relevant scale for our probe. So Q and so L would be two pi over Q. So this value of Q gives you a length and that length tells you how big is your probe. So let's look at the regimes of the probe. If Q minus the inverse of Q is about this wavelength, then that's about 5,000 5, Armstrongs. So this means that the scattering length is larger than the length of the scattering system, than the length scale of the scattering system. So why did I choose 5,000 Armstrongs? What's 5,000 Armstrongs? 500 nanometers, which is the wavelength of what? Visible light, right? Yep. Well, I don't know if it's white, but yeah, not red, but close to red. So if we have visible light, visible light, and we have atomic system, you see that the wavelength is too big. This wavelength right here will be too big for seeing atoms, right? So if we're in that regime, let's write our phase difference, the phase between two particles I and J, is gonna be given by this Q dotted with R I minus RJ. And if we stick that into our S of Q, 
we get one over n, right? So I'm just copying this equation over here. And then the average between, and now I'm gonna have two sums here, i and j sum, e to the negative i j the phase. And what we're saying is that this number, right? Multiply by this number. So this difference right here in length scale is in Armstrong's. And this difference is, uh, this one is one over a thousand Armstrong's or 5,000 Armstrong's, right? So what is this number gonna be? If you have a small number divided by big number, Cosmo? Yeah. Thanks. So if we do this, right, and we're averaging over a bunch of different pairs, but then this number that you have here is big, what you get is that you're just counting things twice and you get n squared over n and you get n. So in this case, because of this, you always get constructive interference. The size right here, difference between this guy and this guy, you always get constructive interference and you always see things. Does that make sense? So you see your n atoms and that's what you're seeing at the end. Let's consider the case. So constructive interference. So let's go to another case. So now this, if Q inverse is gonna be a smaller than, way smaller than this guy. That's the distance between our scattering centers, right? Then we look at the same quantity and we see that this guy now is way smaller. No, the inverse of this is way smaller than this one. So when you do that summation, your S of Q, this particular summation over here, um, this portion, Delta IJ just becomes random numbers. And you would get one over N, the summation E minus I, I, J. And this is the same as N over N, which is one. So here we get constructive interference all the time. Here we get that this is a random number. Well, this one right here. And you're just summing over random numbers so they add up to n instead of n squared. All right, questions about these two cases? We have the two extremes. One, the wavelength is too big. One, the wavelength is too small. The third case is where Goldilocks gets to eat, right? So what happens here? This is too big. What happens here? This is too small, too large. So now let's get that this guy is in the same order as this distance. So the inverse of Q, the scattering length is comparable to the interparticle distance. Then in this case, the phase difference become are really important. And the angular variations, the changing in Q in the scattering field 
are due to the position of the scatters. So this is the case where position of the atoms, in this case atoms, but it could be other scatters, becomes important. Maybe your scatters is a collection of atoms, right? At the, like cold ions. Like uh, I think we, was it the last colloquium that we had that they were scattering of a collection of atoms? I forget, we've, we've been having several colloquiums. So I don't remember if it's the last one or there were two before. So that could be the separation that you're looking at. Your separation, if your separation is in the Armstrong level, that's for atomic systems in crystals. Maybe your separation is atomic systems in cold ions, right? Those could be microns. But then you now see what is the relevant length scale. They have to be comparable to each other. So if we're looking at things in crystals that are wavelength that you have to have that relevant scale L or Q inverse should be in the Armstrong. And that's the size of the prof particles that you're using. Whether it's electron waves, you get to see this with um, electron microscopes where you're sending waves of electrons, whether they're neutrons in neutron scattering facilities, that's the wavelength of the neutron in the right size, the thermal neutrons, or whether you're using light, then you have to be using X-rays. So visible light is for micron scale. Neutrons depends on what temperature you're preparing your neutron. So if the neutrons are really cold, their wavelength is very big. If the neutrons are moving with the right speed, they're called thermal neutrons, and they would be able to probe the atomic length scale. All right, and you guys know about neutrons and um, the wavelength from uh, the, the Broglie wavelength, right? You guys remember that, right? You seen it? So for instance, at the Broglie wavelength of a big object, how to calculate it, and it's gonna be the same size as the object basically, right? So in this case, at the Broglie wavelength is the one that determines the probe of the neutron. So you just send it with the right enough velocity so that it has enough energy so that is the right size. And that's what they do at neutron facilities like Oak Ridge. Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge has that particular capability. And there's others in different places in the world. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. So at this point, let me take you back to 1912. Imagine you're in the time machine, right? You come out out of the time machine uh, with people say that they know what that would they say that atoms exist in 1912 no they would say like oh that's a speculation right so they had been a speculation for centuries that atoms existed x-rays were newly discovered in fact, they're called x-rays because they didn't know what they were. So they were just x-rays, just like planet X. You don't know where it is. But um, this was a new kind of radiation. So there's this guy. So new section, x-ray scattering. 
So we're in 1912. And there's this fellow, his name is Bon Louis, Bon Lao. He was reading and realized and using x-rays and realized like, wait, x-rays, um, might have the right wavelength, the right Q value, so that I could see the distances between atoms. But at this point, atoms were just postulated to exist. Some people believed in them, some of them, well, scientists, right? Nobody had proved that atom existed. And uh, Bon Lao said like, okay, X-rays might be the thing I need here for my experiments. If I have x-rays and they scatter from atoms, it would be like scattering light from gratings. And you guys have seen that experiment where you take a grating and a bunch of gratings, it's just a spacing like this with some spacing, you just shine light through it and the light diffracts. So he was thinking I could do that with atoms and the wavelength of the x-rays should be, we can do it. He then goes and works out the math to figure out how big the scattering effect would be. So things to consider, nobody knew that atoms, that crystals were a periodic array of atoms. That's because people, scientists, not just normal people, didn't even believe that atoms could be real. They thought this is just what the Greeks invented to come up with something, right? So to them, atoms might be or might not be real. Um, X-rays were something new. So people didn't even actually know what X-rays were. Well, I won't get into that. Let's talk about real things. No, I'm just kidding. Whoever is listening to this. <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble. So what happened? Uh, we have um, Monlawe is dreaming about this, goes and realizes I can do this. And then he goes to his supervisor, his research professor. His research professor is Sommerfeld. There's another guy, his last name is, is Wien. So Sommerfeld is the boss. And then there's another fellow by name Wien. So I'm assuming that Sommerfeld would be kind of like Dave or Derek, that if you tell him I just come up with an experiment, he'll be like, you're dumb and slap you, right? Because you're going to just waste resources. No, Dave doesn't do that. <laughs> You're being recorded. I didn't say it, Dave. <laughs> so anyways, they go, Laue shows the results and they're like, we don't believe you. This cannot be done. You're being silly. You wouldn't get diffraction. Even if crystal existed, if crystals existed, you wouldn't be able to get the information because the crystals are moving. Crystals are moving and they, you wouldn't be getting anything out like a grading out of this. So you won't see squat. So let's look at this argument. We have salt. Salt is cl sodium chloride. Sodium chloride atoms, they're arranged in a cubic lattice. Um, people knew about salt crystals by 1912. I mean, they've been used for millennia, right, to flavor our food. So they knew about salt crystals. They knew their anisotropic Young modulus. You guys know what the Young modulus is? It tells you that is one of the material properties, right? And it tells you how soft or hard something is. So they knew that the Young modulus for sodium chloride is like five times 10 to the 11 in ergs. 
over centimeter cube. Chloride has a mass of um, 35 grams per mole. Sodium has a mass of uh, 23 grams per mole. The density of salt using those two values and the density of salt. So this is the density of salt is about 4.29 grams per centimeter cube. So using these three values and assuming a cubic lattice, I can figure out what would be the spacing of the atoms. So in this case, the spacing of the atoms is D and D would be about 2.5 Armstrongs. So we know the density, we know the mass, we can figure out how packed um, the cubic latin, lattice is. 2.5 Armstrongs, make sense? We're good, everybody? All right, so this young modulus is the kind of like the spring constant between the atoms, right? So we assume that the atoms stuck to each other because they're connected through springs. That's what the young modulus is. That's the spring constant. So doing that, we could say, that K is equal to this spacing times the Young modulus. And if we do that with this 2.5 Armstrongs inserted here, we would get that we get a 10 to the four dyne over centimeter. All right, so this is the only part that you might need thermal physics. If you look at the equipartition theorem, it says that thermal fluctuations should be, in this kind of system, this thermal fluctuation should lead to motion, and it depends on the temperature, right? but the motion would be given to you by X to Boltzmann constants times temperature divided by this Kappa value that I calculated up here. And if we do that calculation, we would get two times 10 to the negative 11 meters, which is the same as 0 0.2 Armstrong. So this is what Sommerfeld was thinking when he saw this. He stuck some temperature value. He looked at this young modulus for salt that everybody knew about. And he said, the atoms are separated from each other by 2.5 Armstrongs and they're moving back and forth by 0.2 of an Armstrong. So first thing we have to consider this distance that they're moving back and forth is smaller than this spacing distance, right? Which makes sense because if it was bigger, then the calculation says that the crystal would be melting. If the atoms are moving bigger than the positions in their crystal, then that means that it's not a crystal. It would be a liquid or a gas. However, the X-rays have a wavelength of The wavelength had to be of uh, 
around 10 to the negative 11 meter. So now the wavelength of the X-rays And you have, a diff you have that wavelength and the diffraction is vibrating back and forth a distance bigger than the wavelength. Does that make sense? How could they see anything? That's what Sommerfield said. And he told them, no, don't do the experiment, that's dumb. You're just wasting lab resources. So that was the argument against doing the experiment. So, at that same time, one of the other lab members, his name is, Frederick, he goes, grabs things from the lab, goes to the basement and does an experiment to try to figure this out. Because he thought Van Loo might be right, right? So Sommerfeld didn't let him carry out the experiment because he's wasting lab resources. Frederick goes, pirates some equipment, and then got a diffraction pattern after his second try. So he tried the experiment twice. The first time it didn't work, the second time it worked. Anybody can uh, imagine why the first time he did it, it didn't work? So this is the X-ray source. Here's our crystal. And what did they use back then when you had x-rays and you have seen this picture of the hand, right? With a ring on it. That was the first x-ray that was ever made. What do they use to image those pictures? What are they using? Sorry? Right, what are they using? Do you know? What is it called? Film, right? Film. So then the idea is that you would put a piece of film over here. And you would see a diffraction pattern. So actually, this is what he did. This is what Frederick did in the first experiment. What happens if you put the photographic film there? Well, you're going to get the, there's a scattering of the crystal coming here, but there's also this beam coming at you. So you have this beam overshadowing the scattering. So you would have that there's pockets of diffraction, right? And then pockets that are not being diffracted like that because of the crystal pattern. So in his second, in his first try, he does it like this, and he says like, oh, I'm a dumbass. His second try, he moves it and puts it maybe here, right? And he's able to see this diffraction pattern happen. Does that make sense? The first time he didn't see it because the X-ray source was also coming into and being measured at the same time. So he got the largest effect when he put it away from the original beam, the X-ray source, which makes sense. And then he showed it to Laue. He showed it to Laue and Laue, he, he, Laue came up with the theory of X-ray scattering in one night. So at first he was just thinking this might work and then they did the experiment and then in one night he comes up with the theory. So that's our next step to figure out what happens. And they look, what happens, what are the, the spots that you would get in this film plates if you have a crystal and it could be different types of crystals 
and it could be crystals with a basis. So your unit cell is not the simple unit cell. It could be a crystal like this copper oxide thing that you guys did for the homework with a basis on it. Questions? No? We're good? All right, so let's do what Laue did back in the day. So we have a scattering by crystals. We have looked at a scattering by a single electron in an atom. We had looked at having multiple electrons in the atom. That just gives you a structure actor, the structure factor for that atom. Then if we had a collection of particles, we would also see that there's an interference pattern that comes up and so forth. So now let's look at a crystal. So we have a collection of atoms, but now they're in particular positions. All of the atoms in the crystal are repeating off of a unit cell. So we can describe the crystal and they're ordered and organized arrays of atoms, right? They can even have a basis set. So we have primitive lattice vectors. This tells us where the unit cell is. And we have that R is equal to some integer times A1, another integer times A2, and a final integer times A3. This is the positions of the lattice points. So we can attach atoms. This would be the basis, right? And the location of those is given by, and they could be several of them. So I'm gonna label them by PI. And it would be some fraction of A1, some fraction in A2, and some fraction in A3. So with these two guys, first where all the lattice points are, and then all of the atoms that are decorating the unit cell, if they're not in the lattice position, you have describe all of the, with these two vectors, you have defined um, all the atoms in the crystal. All right, at this point, the question becomes, if you have an incident wave and it's gonna scatter off this ordered collection of atoms called a crystal, how are the incident, incident waves going to scatter out? So we saw that x-rays have the right length to scatter of, to be the right size for the atomic distances, right? And also, I told you from simple arguments that Summerfield had that we shouldn't be able to see these guys. But nonetheless, we have X-ray scattering being measured even more than a hundred years ago. So how does it, why is it that 
they could be able to see them even with the vibrations of the lattice. That's what we need to figure out right now. So the first thing we can do is define all of the atoms. We could treat each of the atoms as a scatterer. with an atomic form factor and then we use and let me write the equation for that we have this equation that takes the integral of the density like this right and use that as our starting point. Or what we could do too is use the symmetry and that the atoms, the order nature of the atoms that is the symmetry of the system and figure out how to do it in an easy way. So by the second way, what we do is that we just figure out how it works for a unit cell. So now we would have the scattering form factor of the cell and then this is the sum over all of the atoms inside the unit cell the basis each of them has an atomic form factor right and then this pi is this pi over here work it out for us for a unit cell, the small group of atoms, find this atomic form factor for the cell. And then finding the interference of the waves. So that's the goal, to figure out how things interfere with each other. So let me write this out. You're gonna have the incoming wave in that direction. Then here you, you might have like a little unit cell like that, but there's actually a bunch of unit cells, right? This is your crystal. Out of each of them, you're gonna see that there's some scattering. This is the, from this lattice. There's another one from this lattice. There's another one. All of the lattices are gonna scatter like that, I would have this scatter radiation for each of the cells. And then my detector would be over here where I see and capture all of this scatter radiation. All right. So from before, we have an structure factor that goes like this, summation over i and j, e to the negative i q, dotted 
R I minus R J. So previously we said, we're gonna do ensemble average and we have a bunch of different systems that are very similar. Here, we don't even have to ensemble average because our unit cell is perfectly repeated all over the crystal. So we just have to do it once and don't have even to ensemble average. Assuming that the crystal is perfect, right? So for a crystal, as a function of Q, this scatter factor has the one over N term. Then we have the I and J summation, e to the negative I, Q dotted with R I minus R J. This is the same as one over N I J um, E to the negative I Q. And then here, I'm just gonna expand it. We're gonna have an arbitrary side, I'll call it RO. And from there, we're gonna go, well, I'm putting it out of order. This is RI. And then the other one is RO plus uh, capital RJ. So those would be the positions that I have. And this R0 is one of the sites that I could have an arbitrary one. This is just one of the translation vectors, right? Is one of these guys. All right, so what we have here then is that we could rewrite this and because these translation vectors are the same guys, this would just become a one over N and then the squared of just one of them or the modulus square. Like that. So before going in that direction, we have here a multiplication that goes Q and R. And when we're doing this, we know that we have particular values of this E to the IQ dot R. So when you multiply this exponentials, right? You're gonna multiply things together, but basically when you do this square factor, what you're doing is that each of the summations is gonna give you a one or a negative one, one or negative one, one or negative one. Because you're multiplying two complex numbers together, right? The same complex number, you're taking the, the value of it. And sometimes they would um, cancel out and sometimes they would add up to a bunch of ones together. Does that make sense? All right. So then what we need to do is figure out what are the allowed scattering vectors. The question is at what Q does the scattering become intense? So intense scattering means that we have constructive interference. So if we have GI dotted with RI, we would be getting 
zero to pi or pi and so forth. This would be the only time that a scattering is happening. And I think I use the same notation, right? I use the G for the um, vectors in momentum space. So this vectors is in A1, A2, and 3. And these vectors were the ones that have B1, B2, B3, and is for your reciprocal lattice. So this is the vectors in the reciprocal lattice. These are the vectors in the real space lattice. I did use the same notation, right? So you guys know exactly which ones I'm talking about. So if we have this ones, we're gonna get two pi, four pi, six pi, and keep going like that. And if you have e to the zero, you get one. If you have e to the two pi, you get one. If you get e to the two n pi, with n being any integer, you get one. So those are the ones that we care about because the other ones could be one minus one, one minus one, one minus one. This one would be one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one. Make sense? So if we do that, we see that these are, these guys give you the discrete. There's just a few. Of all of the Q vectors, only the ones that match up with this guy will have constructive interference. For all of the other vectors Q, only these ones that add up to GI give you positive, positive. The other ones could give you zeros or positive, negative, positive, negative, which add up to zero. So that means that the other ones All the other ones don't work. So we have the crystal, <coughs> where did I put it? Oh, over here. So we have this equation for the crystal right here, right? Let me rewrite it. And now I know what are the good Q values. So we have this S of Q. It's gonna be the one over N summation E to the I Q dot with some R I, all of this squared. That's one over N. Let me do the summation here and I would have And instead of being per particle, okay, let me write it down over here. So I have the one over N. Instead of being a sum over the particles in my unit cell, I'm gonna do it over the positions, but I have N1 is equal to zero to whatever value goes up to E to the negative i n1 this is my integer right q dotted by a1 then i would have the one that goes within two e to the negative i and two q dotted with a two. And then I have the last one, which is n three is equal to zero all the way up to whichever one it reaches and three q dotted by a three. 
all of this is squared. So basically I'm just rewriting this Ri into all of the vectors that is composed of A1 times N1 plus A2 times N2, N3, A3 and so forth. So we have that each of these summations is gonna run over the lattice of the crystal. And we're gonna consider as many crystal lattices as we need. And we would get the structure factor for our crystal being the multiplication of these three terms. Okay. Now what we need is that these three terms, QA1, QA2, QA3, become a maximal at the same time for the three values. And that's what we're gonna do for our next class. Okay, I'm out of time. Questions? No? All right.